Um, good morning, everybody. Um, good to see you. Um, today, uh, we wanted to give you some additional um, context and briefing for the President's trip. Um, yesterday, we were able to focus at length on the extraordinary economic dynamism of the Asia-Pacific region and the U.S. interest um, in, again, expanding our own uh, presence here in the region. Um, today, uh, we're very lucky to have with us Admiral Willard, the head of uh, United States Pacific Command uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, he'll be able to give you uh, some context on the U.S. commitment to the security of the region. Um, I'd note that um, it, you know, the, the precise um, economic dynamism that we've seen here at the APEC summit uh, is very much underpinned by the long-standing U.S. presence in the region, um, the U.S. commitment to be there for our allies and partners in the region, but also to serve as an anchor of stability in the region. Um, and it's precisely that effort over many decades that has enabled, I think, the peaceful development that we see uh, so manifested here at the APEC uh, summit. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Admiral Willard to give a, um, some opening comments, uh, and then we'll take your questions. Thank you, Ben, and good morning, everyone. Uh, very much look forward to the exchange uh, that we'll have. My name is uh, Bob Willard, and I've been uh, the commander of United States Pacific Command for uh, just uh, over two years' time now. In my previous assignment, I was the commander of uh, United States Pacific Fleet, same area of responsibility, um, but on the Navy side. So for the past four and a half years, I've had the opportunity to uh, to work very closely with uh, the regional leadership uh, in providing, helping provide security across the Asia-Pacific region, which is the main thrust of U.S. Pacific Command. It's why we're here. Uh, the responsibility extends from the, the U.S. forces on the west coast of the United States and Alaska to a dividing line between India and Pakistan. Uh, the command is comprised of 320,000 uh, uniformed members, civilians, and, and uh, contractors uh, that help to contribute to Pacific Command's mission. Uh, we do have uh, forces forward here in Hawaii uh, on the island of Guam and uh, located in uh, Japan with our Japan alliance, uh, allies uh, to the tune of about 50,000 forces. And there's another 30,000 U.S. forces that are helping to maintain the armistice uh, in the, on the Korean Peninsula alongside our allies, the Republic of Korea. Uh, there are essentially five areas of principal focus uh, within Com Pacific Command that I thought I might share with you to develop uh, some context for the questions that you might ask. Um, of those five, uh, one is managing our our uh, relationship with China, which is very obviously um, uh, undergoing a tremendous uh, change in the region given uh, China's advancements both uh, economically and militarily. Uh, one of my charters is to improve the relationship mill to mill between the United States and, and the Chinese. And we endeavor to do that across a, a large spectrum of engagement uh, with China wherever and whenever we can. Uh, second in that is uh, managing the, uh, the threat posed by North Korea. Uh, for more than 50 years, alongside our allies, the Republic of Korea, we've been deterring North Korea and maintaining the armistice across uh, the demilitarized zone. Uh, and uh, in this day, uh, North Korea is posing additional challenges uh, in terms of nuclearization, uh, proliferation, uh, the stability uh, construct within North Korea, and of course, they're undergoing succession. Uh, we are attending to many of those things and attempting to contribute uh, to uh, the whole of U.S. government and international effort to see North Korea alter their trajectory. Uh, but our main focus is in uh, our alignment with our allies in South Korea continuing to deter uh, provocations such as we encountered uh, last year in 2010 with the sinking of the Corvette Chonan and the attack against Yongpyong Island. And, uh, and we'll continue to uh, reinforce the alliance, continue to strengthen it, uh, as has been discussed uh, in 
President Lee's visit to the United States uh, and uh, President Obama's uh, comments on the region and Secretary Panetta's very recent visit to, uh, to South Korea. Uh, thirdly, we uh, deal with a great many transnational threats in the region. They range from uh, proliferation to trafficking in humans and trafficking in drugs to uh, violent extremist organizations. We're laid down in the southern Philippines, continuing to contain uh, Abu Sayyaf Group and Jamaa Islamiyah, uh, two extremist organizations that threaten both the stability of the southern Philippines and, and the region. Uh, and in South Asia, around India, uh, we endeavor to contain lashkar e taiba a Pakistani-based extremist organization uh, that uh, threatens India, attacked Mumbai, and, uh, and we find ourselves working with partners in Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Maldives to uh, build their capacities uh, to deal with this uh, organization um, independently. Uh, thirdly, we, uh, we have a special focus area on our relationship with India, a strategic partnership that continues to grow, uh, both government to government and military to military. India is the largest democracy in South Asia. It's the most consequential military in the region, and, uh, and it operates in a, in a fairly challenging neighborhood. Our relationship with India is not, not very old. Um, we were not particularly close during the Cold War, and when we did begin to re-engage, uh, uh, those relationships were interrupted uh, following nuclear tests in the late 1990s. From a military standpoint, we've enga been engaged with India uh, for only about seven or eight years. And uh, that's not very long when you consider uh, that this is the largest democracy in the world and a very large military. Our, our relationship is now strong and growing stronger. Uh, we engage with the Indian Armed Forces across all the services, and we contribute to issues such as piracy in the Gulf of Aden and elsewhere uh, in the Indian Ocean region and broader maritime security throughout the region. And we, uh, we look forward to continuing to advance our Indian partnership along the way. And then fifth is our overall uh, alliances and partnerships in the region and the responsibility that we bear to strengthen those. We have five treaty allies in the Asia Pacific, uh, including Japan, the Republic of Korea, Thailand, the Philippines, and our Australia friends. Uh, these alliances form in many, in many ways the basis for uh, security in the region. And uh, one of uh, our uh, endeavors is to improve those alliances and strengthen those alliances along the way. Um, we are uh, obviously very close, uh, having been hosted uh, for many years in Japan and in the Republic of the Philippines. These are very advanced militaries, very interoperable with the United States, uh, and we uh, work very closely together uh, with their military leadership. Uh, in the case of Australia, again, a very strong uh, ally that uh, we find along our, alongside the United States uh, wherever we're operating in the world. Um, and in the case of the Republic of the Philippines and Thailand, very old relationships, strong mill-to-mill -mill relationships that continue to evolve uh, and we hope advance. Uh, so, and then we have a variety of partnerships to include the likes of Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, and others in the region that, uh, that uh, we're continuing to grow both the military relationship in order to contribute to broader security in the Asia Pacific region, uh, as well as uh, enable the, the very uh, strong ties and engagement government to government and, uh, and, uh, and economically with the United States and with our other allies and partners. With that, I'll stop and, uh, and uh, open uh, to this to questions, and I very much look forward to the dialogue. Peter. Admiral, thank you for uh, doing this. Um, a question about China's uh, actions in the South China Sea. Um, some um, uh, Asian Pacific nations seem concerned about this. Is there anything the United States can do militarily to reassure them that we'll assist and um, we're taking an interest in what China's um, China's movements in the South China Sea. Well, thank you. Uh, let me begin by just offering that the South China Sea 
uh, is a very important uh, maritime common for the entire region. Uh, the sea lines of communication uh, that crisscross the South China Sea carry $5.3 trillion in bilateral annual trade, of which $1.2 trillion is U.S. trade. So the South China Sea region and the sea lines that it contains is incredibly vital to the region, uh, to our partners and allies, and certainly uh, to the United States. And we've maintained a presence there for uh, nearly 150 years, and for the past 60 years have maintained a continual presence in and about those sea lines of communication to ensure the, the uh, ongoing security and, and uh, stability of the South, South China Sea region. Uh, we work very closely with uh, all the partners in the region with regard to its security against a variety of potential uh, threats such as piracy uh, over the years. And, uh, and while uh, the United States and, its, and uh, our uh, partners in, in multilateral forums such as ASEAN uh, have expressed concern over the past year regarding uh, assertiveness on the part of, uh, of China in this region, we continue to seek to dialogue with China in those areas in order that they will uh, constructively contribute to the security of this vital region um, as we and our partners uh, uh, are attempting to do. So uh, once again, it, the South China Sea, uh, a vital interest to the region, a national interest to the United States, an area that carries an immense amount of commerce and an area in which we must maintain uh, maritime security and, uh, and peace uh, and uh, not see disruptions as a consequence of contested areas and others. So, uh, so very important to me. We continue to maintain a presence there. We haven't really changed that presence uh, in the time uh, that I've been in command or previously in my career. We've always maintained a robust presence there, and that in itself is, I think, the security and assurance that we provide our partners in the region uh, that will uh, continue to contribute to the peace in the South China Sea. Steve? Spot on that. Um, what do you think of the chances that uh, there could be a miscalculation by various nations which have territorial claims in the South China Sea? I mean, is there a danger of a war? Uh, so <coughs> the danger of a clash which could lead to a military uh, confrontation? I think that's precisely what uh, the the co contributions of the United States military and the regional militaries are intending to prevent. Um, we, uh, we observe the, uh, uh, the peaceful negotiation that occurs with regard to the contested areas in the region. Uh, remember that there are six uh, nations involved in the various, in contesting over the various features and islands. Uh, throughout the South China Sea, and, uh, and the United States' uh, position is that uh, these uh, uh, contested regions will be uh, ultimately resolved peacefully, uh, hopefully through multilateral forums such as ASEAN and discussions uh, that can take place in forums such as East Asia, Asia Summit, uh, and through dialogue between uh, the contesting partners. In the meantime, I think it's vitally important that uh, that the region remain uh, peaceful and that the sea lines of communi communication remain uninterrupted by confrontation or any form of conflict that would take place. So we're there to prevent it. Uh, and, I, and thus far, we've been successful in doing that. Admiral, so describe the, the threat of the Al-Qaeda affiliates in the Philippines. Is it a threat to the Philippines, a threat to the United States? What's your sense? Yeah, we've been uh, we've been working with the armed forces of the Philippines in their support against uh, specifically Abu Sayyaf group and Jamaa Islamiyah for uh, seven years, and uh, we believe that by and large we've achieved the containment of those particular groups. Jamaa Islamiyah and Abu Sayyaf group uh, are were affiliates of uh, of Al Qaeda uh, to include. Uh, sanctuary that was being provided for purposes of financing and, and other endeavors. 
That has been, uh, by and large, curtailed. We continue to contain them in that regard so that they don't grow into to become a, a more significant uh, threat to the region. And we may be at a, at a point where we can work on a transition to a next phase uh, of operations in the Philippines. Well, we've got 500 special operators there now. And uh, at the point in time when uh, we believe that the extremist organizations themselves are sufficiently contained, then uh, our government and the government of the Philippines um, may transition to a longer term effort to set the condition, the longer term permanent conditions uh, to uh, minimize or eliminate uh, the prospects that either of those extremist organizations could reemerge to become both a national a threat to the Philippines and or a threat to the region in the United States. Just through military or is that through some sort of negotiation or what, what's the... I think that's through a whole of government level of effort on the part of the government of the Philippines to work with the people and, and, uh, and communities in southern Mindanao and the Sulu archipelago, uh, again, to set the conditions there that uh, minimize any prospects of emerging uh, violent extremism or violent extremist organizations, these two in particular. Abu Sayyaf Group, as you know, is, has been around a long time, uh, an organization that is by and large criminal and in the containment effort that has been made by the Armed Forces of the Philippines over the last seven years, they've pretty much uh, quelled their extremist uh, uh, efforts with the exception of ongoing criminal activity at a, at a lesser level that continues to occur. Thank you. To, um, to what extent do you think the U.S. buildup of its military presence in Australia will reassure uh, partners in the region um, regarding China and its uh, claims on the South China Sea. To what extent will that serve as a, a counterweight to that? And could you also talk about to what extent you're expecting these issues around the South China Sea to be um, worked out or advanced during the upcoming East Asia Summit? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I would just, uh, I would offer that um, it's been very much a part of the public record that, uh, that Australia made overtures to the United States to incre increase our engagement uh, with the uh, armed forces uh, of Australia and uh, our utility of, uh, of the training facilities, ranges, and so forth uh, that are there. That was unprecedented, and very, you know, we're very grateful for that uh, uh, overture. I'm not in a position to make any announcement with regard to, uh, to the future plans. I think I would leave that to uh, Prime Minister Gillard and, and to President Obama um, in the future. So we, uh, we have a very, very tight, close relationship with our Australian friends. We train in Australia on a fairly routine basis. There is a large-scale combined armed exercise that we conduct annually, and, uh, and uh, the Australians are a very generous military insofar as access to their, their bases and, and, uh, and to their training facilities. Uh, are concerned. In terms of, of the South China Sea in the East Asian Summit, again, I would leave that uh, to our President uh, and to our Secretary of State uh, to, um, to discuss with the, uh, the members there. This is a uh, first opportunity for the United States uh, in the summit, and I think uh, uh, this is going to be um, a very positive uh, outcome and, and uh, opportunity for the United States uh, and our uh, partners to, to be part of uh, the East Asia Forum. Well, putting aside whatever announcements you know, may be coming later this week, the Secretary Panetta has been clear about the fact that he wants to increase the U.S. military and intends to increase U.S. military presence in, Aus in Australia and in the region. So speaking more generally, do you think that that would serve as any kind of a, a counterweight to China as far as our partners in the region are concerned? Uh, yeah, I, would, I think I'd put it a, a little different way. As you heard in my opening remarks, um, the forces that are forward in the Western Pacific are by and large biased to Northeast Asia, uh, contained in, in Japan, or laid down in Japan and, and South Korea. As a consequence, in order for Pacific Command to be present, conduct the, engage, the engagement, capacity building with other militaries, and 
respond to humanitarian needs and disaster in Southeast Asia. I'm, uh, I'm forced to deploy and, and sustain forces that are located there. Any opportunities that we have to uh, rotate forces uh, in the Southeast Asia region um, relieves some pressure on that need to, at great expense, deploy and sustain forces uh, present in Southeast Asia. I mentioned the ongoing presence in the South China Sea. Um, those are deployed forces either from the, the west coast of the United States, transiting forces to and from the Indian Ocean region, or they're from the forward deployed uh, forces that are located in, uh, in Japan uh, and or Korea. So, uh, so uh, any rebalancing that can take place over time to permit the United States to uh, more effectively uh, be present uh, in the region, I think, is, uh, is a positive step. Uh, and that includes uh, South Asia as well. So we uh, very much um, look forward to, uh, to scoping the, the posture needs of the Pacific Command and, and, uh, and our for forward forces and adjusting them as required uh, as the security situation in the Asia Pacific uh, dictates. Uh, remember that our Army forces and our Marine Corps forces spend a great deal of time uh, both being first responders to uh, disasters. Currently, we're assessment teams are in Thailand, continuing to assess the flooding that the Thailand uh, people have experienced. Um, and uh, in addition to responding to those disasters, we work very closely with other militaries in the region, their ground forces, to improve their capacities and self-sufficiency as armed forces. Jackie. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to what the um, Pacific Command is doing to counter China's heavy investment in um, anti-access and access to technology. Yeah, you, I, I know you've all heard uh, um, discussed many times uh, the uh, anti-access area denial investments that have been made, not just by China, frankly, but uh, but around the world, and, and uh, the United States Armed Forces uh, continues to uh, make the kind of investments uh, both in the tactics, techniques, and procedures we use and in the future technologies that we'll acquire to enable us to operate anywhere in the world. And if, uh, and if there are area denial technologies that are in play anywhere in the world, it's important that the United States military be able to access that space regardless. In terms of, uh, of the Western Pacific, uh, we are present uh, in the South China Sea and East China Sea and elsewhere on a very routine basis, and, uh, and we have no intentions of, of uh, going anywhere. Uh. The Defense Department recently announced that they started implementation of joint air sea battle concept. And my question is, what is the implication of ECO side? And what do you expect from regional allies? Uh, especially, I'd like to hear about Japan along with the implementation. Yeah, thank you. I, the, uh, the air sea battle concept has been uh, an ongoing uh, process in the, in the Pentagon for some time, intending to uh, bring uh, the capabilities of our Navy and the capabilities of our Air Force together, and frankly, the uh, contributions of our other services as well, but to bring them together in a way that achieves greater synergy than we have in the past. You might consider that, uh, that for nearly 30 years we've been attempting to perfect joint warfare, and, and at one point we looked at a land-air battle construct where the Army and Air Force attempted to compare their respective capabilities and improve on those and achieve synergies over land uh, uh, that, that would, uh, would cause us to uh, make an evolutionary step from uh, or within the joint warfare concept. Air-sea battle is essentially the same uh, effort being made between the uh, maritime service and the air service to try and maximize our capabilities together. Uh, to operate in any um, uh, space denied or otherwise. Admiral, could you talk a little bit about your own uh, impressions or feelings? We had heard Secretary Panetta talk 
just a few days ago about possibly uh, inviting aggression by cuts that would take place if uh, the Congressional Committee can't come through with the, uh, you know, the plan that it needs to come through with. He talked specifically about, he said, uh, ship without sailor, sailors, brigade without bullets, things like that. What effect could that have on our ability to maintain a forward presence in the Asia Pacific? Yeah. Thank you. I, well, I think, you know, first and foremost, I mean, we're all very aware that, uh, that we're coming uh, off of uh, a period of long-term warfare for the country. I mean, we're eventually uh, transitioning from two wars, uh, and we're facing budgetary challenges as a nation that have to be addressed. So the Department of Defense, in realizing that, is you know, scoping uh, what those outcomes may mean for the Department of Defense. And as a senior uh, military leader, you know, I'm part of those discussions and, and, uh, uh, and certainly interested in, in the outcomes. Um, you mentioned specifically the prospect of sequester and, and, uh, uh, and I know that uh, it's shared broadly that sequester would be a, a rather draconian approach to the problem and it would complicate um, the, uh, the budgetary approaches that the Department of Defense is scoping right now considerably were it to occur. Um, shifting from that and, and that ongoing uh, discussion that has to occur in Washington and has to occur in the Pentagon, I would offer that as the commander in the Pacific, I have been well served even during the course of two wars uh, in, our, in our country with regard to the forces that I've had on hand, their readiness and their ability to respond to uh, the issues that we've faced here in the, in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and I have every confidence that in the decisions that our government makes, that our administration makes, and, and that are made in the Pentagon, given the importance of this region to the world and the importance of this region to the United States, that Pacific Command will continue to be well served and able to carry out its mission of assurance and deterrence where required um, to the foresee into the foreseeable future. Admiral, how would you assess the threat of piracy right now in the Asian Pacific region? And moving forward, what are your greatest challenges do you think to deal with this? Yeah, thank you. Um, piracy still exists in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, as you know, if you ranged back about uh, seven or eight years, we had a significant piracy problem that was manifesting itself in, uh, in the Strait of Malacca. And it was uh, the nations of of uh, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand that came together and began to patrol in earnest uh, the Strait of Malacca and quelled piracy quite a bit. Uh, typically when you drive pirates out of one region, they tend to, to appear in another. And in the south portion of the South China Sea, we've experienced some piracy uh, that has reemerged and, and have to patrol for that and account for that and continue to work with our partners on, uh, on seeing that uh, done away with. In the Indian Ocean region, uh, due to the uh, challenges that we have with the Horn of Africa and Somalia, the Somali pirates have driven merchant traffic hundreds of miles into the Indian Ocean. So this is a good illustration, given our earlier conversation, on how any disruption to the sea lines of communication can be costly. If you can imagine now uh, the merchant ships emanating from the Gulf of Aden are swinging so far uh, to the east that they are entering Pacific Command uh, area of responsibility in and around India's exclusive economic zone, uh, the, ec in, in the uh, uh, Sri Lankan economic exclusion zone, and, and that of the Maldives. And so we're teaming now with India and those nations to attempt to contain the piracy that is re-emerging in the Pacific Command AOR due to uh, the effects of the Somali pilot, pirate challenge that we were faced with there. So, uh, so in the region, piracy continues to be a challenge. Um, and we continue to observe for it, respond to it, and we're seeking uh, the long-term solutions, especially in uh, the less governed areas like Somalia to see it uh, done away with completely. Uh, in terms of greatest challenges for, for PACOM, I mean, I would venture that uh, those five that I outlined for you are, uh, in fact, remaining the areas of focus for PACOM into the future. Uh, we'll continue to work 
uh, to manage the relationship with China, hopefully in a positive trajectory where China emerges as a constructive partner in uh, the overall security of the region. Uh, we'll continue to deal with North Korea and hopefully see an end state that meets the needs of, uh, of South Korea, meets the needs of the region and the broader international community. And I know that uh, involves denuclearization and, and uh, affecting the other factors in North Korea that are a challenge. We'll continue to deal with violent extremism and, and other transnational challenges. Uh, and we'll continue to build our partnerships with India and with our allies and partners over time. Um, the purpose of Pacific Command is the security of the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, we've been, uh, I think, uh, helping to enable prosperity here for the past six decades. It's an unprecedented time of growth and expansion economically for the region, and we intend to continue to contribute to the overall security and stability here so that that prosperity can be advanced. And, and that is both the mission and focus of, of U.S. Pacific Command and the Department of Defense in this part of the world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Admiral. We're going to have to stop it there. Uh, but uh, uh, I just want to, um, uh, again, reinforce that uh, I think this is a, will provide very important and useful um, context going forward. I think you'll see in the coming days the President speaking to the range of uh, issues that the Admiral uh, touched upon. Um, both in his trip to Australia and then, of course, at the East Asia Summit. And, of course, uh, you know, I'd say it's no coincidence, for instance, that after a successful state visit um, from President Lee, we'll be meeting with our other four uh, treaty allies on the course of the trip. We already met with Japan. Um, going forward, we'll obviously go to Australia, meet with Philippines, Thailand. We'll be addressing um, a number of the issues uh, the Admiral spoke about, uh, whether it's uh, again, the U.S. presence in the region, but also uh, our commitment to maritime security at the East Asia Summit. Uh, and then finally, I think what um, President Obama, um, again, has been very focused on is responding to um, both the extraordinary interest we have in the region, but also a demand um, an, an interest from the nations of the region for the United States to play a role, um, whether it's on a bilateral basis of building partnerships um, or on a multilateral basis of the United States being deeply engaged with ASEAN, um, being engaged at the head of state level for the first time at the East Asia Summit, precisely so we can address um, the range of challenges that confront the region. So um, I think all the, uh, you know, the, the questions that you hit upon in, in the course of the briefing um, are precisely in line with the types of things we'll be discussing in Australia uh, and in Bali. So this is, a, again, a great opportunity. We thank, again, Admiral Willard for giving a, a very comprehensive presentation here today. Yep. Weird reports out of it. <coughs> they calling it mysterious. Uh, you, you know, we've seen those reports. Um, uh, I don't think we have anything um, specific in terms of, of comment on it, uh, other than to say that we're uh, we're obviously monitoring it. And uh, do you know that it has any site security? Um, I, you know, again, I wouldn't get into the specifics of the site. We understand it's associated with the IRGC, um, but beyond that, I don't think we'd get into any specifics on it. Okay. Do you have anything on the reports from South Korea of riots uh, related to the free trade agreement there? Uh, we don't. Uh, you know, I, uh, again, I, I think uh, uh, we, we just saw those reports as well. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Obviously, there's been, you know, a robust um, um, debates around these issues of trade within Korea for many years. Um, but again, I, I think we're just aware of those reports. And uh, we'll take a look at that and, and let you know if we have further comment. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.